Father in heaven, Lord, it's true my brain is feeble, but it's your wisdom and the help of the Spirit are without limit. And so I pray that you'll guide and help me get the words right. And I pray that your Spirit will speak to all our hearts, however you wish. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I, I, I put the, um, or I had um, my helper put the popular view of final events up here. Because you remember, and I didn't say this this morning, but one of the things we're going over is we're going over stuff to understand better so that we're more capable of talking with evangelicals who view things differently than we do. And I didn't emphasize that this morning. But looking at their view, um, they have a seven-year time of the end or a, a tribulation um, starting with the secret rapture, three and a half years of global government building up, Antichrist ruling from the temple, and then three and a half years of severe persecution, and then Christ coming in power and glory. So they see, I imagine, that Armageddon is toward the end there, but sometimes when you listen to them, it's not real clear where they're putting it. And so uh, let's go to the uh, biblical view of final events, the Last days are triggered by the Sunday law. Three angels' messages go with power. There's persecution during that period. There'll be many martyrs. And then the close of probation. And not until the close of probation can the seven last plagues be poured out because they are the most severe uh, disasters that God has ever brought on the earth. And while he's still in interceding, they cannot come out. And so in those seven plagues, um, we have the first four Ellen White describes in the chapter, The Time of Trouble and the Great Controversy. And after she describes those four, she says, these plagues are not universal, otherwise the earth would be destroyed. And then she doesn't mention plagues five, six, and seven in that chapter. When you get to the next chapter in Great Controversy, God's people delivered, she describes the fifth and sixth plagues, but she doesn't tell you that she's describing them. And then she quotes from the seventh plague, and it kind of puts it all of a sudden all together. And what's interesting, and I didn't say this this morning either, in those sets of seven in the book of Revelation, usually the last three are markedly different than the first four. And, you know, like with the seven churches, um, you know, we, we like to take those seven churches and give the historical interpretation, which I've done many times through the Christian history, but when Ellen White talks about Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, she talks about them as the choices that are before us now. We're either Sardis and we're dead, or a Laodicea and lukewarm, or we're Philadelphia, and that's the, the right one to be. She puts them contemporary in their spiritual meaning for the end of time. And, so, and then when you go to the seven trumpets, the, third, the last three are the, are the woes. They're distinct from the first four. And the plagues are the same thing. The first four plagues are consecutive. And what we're going to see today is that plagues five, six, and seven are almost all one event. And I guarantee you probably never heard that before. But you'll see it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. And um, so, but here's the thing. One reason we can't talk to evangelicals about Armageddon and one reason we can't talk to them about their view is because we don't have a clear understanding of our own. How can you talk to somebody about their view when you're not sure what your own is? It just can't be done. And so we stay away from it because when they start talking about Armageddon and they start talking about drying up the Euphrates, how do we engage in that? We don't. And we're missing tremendous opportunities because, well, we don't know our Bibles as well as we sometimes think we do. And I hope you don't mind me saying that. I, I think sometimes I might sound arrogant when I, because, you know, two weeks ago, I said my greatest disappointment becoming a pastor is how little Adventists really want to study deeply. And that could sound like, well, you know, I'm looking down at everybody. I'm just telling you the truth. I haven't found a great fervor for deeper Bible study, not too much. But I've never said that in any other church before. You know why I think I felt comfortable saying it here? Because I think there's more people here that really want to than most places I've been. And, so, and I'm hopeful. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right. So, but the big question is, who are the kings of the East? You know, there's good news if we continue with the typology 
regarding the fall of Babylon. Over 160 years in advance, Isaiah predicted that when they were in Babylonian captivity, God would raise up a man to deliver them. And here we have Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 41.2. It says, Who raised up the righteous man from the east? Gave him the nations before him and made him rule over kings. Now we know who this man is, but it's interesting that he's called the righteous man from the east and he was a pagan. Why, why would the Bible describe him as righteous if he's a pagan? And then in the same chapter, verse 25 it says, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. He shall call upon my name, and he shall come against princes as upon mortar and as a potter treads clay. So what direction is the rising of the sun? It's east, right? And matter of fact, in the Bible, whenever you see the rising of the sun, if you actually look up the Hebrew word, the definition will be rising, sunlight, sunrise, or east. It's the same word as in Isaiah 41 2, the righteous man from the east. It's the same word in the Hebrew. Okay, so this is interesting because we know that the rising sun comes up in the east. So when this person comes from the east, what is implied will happen to Babylon? Yeah, because when it says he shall come against princesses upon mortar and potter treads clay, this is not good for Babylon. Babylon will be destroyed. Now, Isaiah tells us more. Isaiah even gives us the name of the one that come from the east uh, decades and decades before he was even born. And he tells us how he would conquer the unconquerable Babylon. Just like Jeremiah, the last time I presented, we only looked at verses from Jeremiah on this, but he predicts the drying up of the waters of the Babylon just as Jeremiah did. So let's take a look at it. The last couple of verses of Isaiah 44 and the first verse of 45 says, that says to the deep, be dry and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings and to open for him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. So according to um, Isaiah's prophecy, what would happen for God's people in captivity in Babylon? What we saw here, if you go back a slide, he'll perform my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you should be built into the temple, your foundation should be, should be laid. So what does that mean? It means the Jews that were in captivity would get to go back to their homeland free and to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Babylonians decades before when they conquered Judah. So Cyrus, the one from the rising of the sun, the one from the east, is a deliverer of God's Old Testament people, the Jews. Think about the typology there. Now, since the Lord called Cyrus my shepherd... And he also called him his anointed. And there's a word that means the anointed one. Does anyone know what that word is? Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. And so since Cyrus is called his shepherd and his anointed, and Messiah means anointed one, it is clear that Cyrus is intended to pre prefigure the coming Messiah, as a deliverer. In other words, Cyrus is a type of Christ. Christ is truly the great shepherd, the anointed one, the real Messiah, the truly righteous man from the east. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer, delivering us from sin through his sacrifice on the cross. Amen? Amen. So let's make the connection now with Revelation 16, 12, with the drying up the Euphrates and the coming kings of the east. Just as Cyrus was God's anointed one from the east and delivered God's people from literal ancient Babylon, Christ is the anointed one from the rising of the sun from the east who will deliver his people from spiritual Babylon when he comes in glory at his second coming. 
He is the one who causes the Euphrates to dry up for the support system of spiritual Babylon to come to an end. And John intends us to understand that the kings of the east are Jesus and his army from heaven coming to the earth as it's so well pre depicted in Revelation 19. In fact, I'll go back to that slide. Who are the kings of the east? And there's a picture from Revelation 19. Kind of a dead giveaway, I guess. But, uh, but he's coming to rescue his people at the end of time. Now, there's one thing missing here that would be very important. Is Jesus ever called the one from the east? Is Jesus ever called the one from the rising of the sun? And we're going to go to a verse where he actually is, but it's easy to miss because a different word is used. Luke 1, 78, 79, these words are about Jesus. It says, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited, visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness. So what does day spring mean? From where does each day spring forth? Each day springs forth from the east, of course. Now, here's where I think it's kind of cool. And, you know, I'm not a person who feels like everybody needs to learn Greek and Hebrew, but I don't understand why you don't want to know more because there's some real insight right here because it probably shouldn't be surprising that the Greek word that's translated day spring, the definition of it is east or rising. And not surprisingly, it's the exact same Greek word for which the translator, translators chose to translate east in Revelation 16, 12. It's the exact same word. Jesus is called the one from the east here in this verse. So in, in Luke 178, this is directly applied to Jesus. And he and his angels are definitely intended by the phrase, the kings of the east. So from what direction did Jesus say his coming would be? Matthew 24, 27, it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. From what direction is Jesus' glorious second coming and who will come with him? Here's an interesting verse from Ezekiel 43, 2. It says, The glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east and the earth shined <clears throat> with his glory. Excuse me, I'm going to take a cough drop. You know, I, I like to sing so much, but when you sing you, and you have a cold, it, your voice doesn't last too long. I was singing at least part of the time. All right, so. All right, so in this verse, Ezekiel 43, 2, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east and the earth shined with his glory. And then you go to this one, the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. So it's, it's pretty, the, the typology is very simple, really. So what special message or work does God, does the Bible say comes from the east? Now, I'm not going to go into this too much, but um, this verse here, from Ezekiel is paraphrased or quoted in Revelation 18.1. Revelation 18.1 is that mighty angel that comes down and his glory shines, covers the earth, and it's the car loud cry to come out of her, my people. So that final message comes from the east because it, it parallels this verse. And then in um, um, Daniel 11.44, and in Daniel 11, 40 and on, you have the king of the north aggressively pursuing and taking over things. And then verse 44 says, but tidings out of the east shall trouble him. And then he goes with fury to try to stop the message. Tidings out of the east fits perfectly with the three angels' messages at the end of the world. All right, so what other special message um, or work, does the Bible say, comes from the east. Revelation 7, 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. See, when God comes with messages or when he comes personally, it seems like he always comes from the east. 
All right, so that brings us to the next question. What is Armageddon? Why does John call this final gathering of the whole world Armageddon? What does the word Armageddon mean? Do you think that the typology for the drying of the Euphrates and typology for the coming kings of the East just might be a clue that there's typology for Armageddon too? Are there Old Testament stories that will provide a framework to understand Armageddon? Well, let's look at the meaning of the word first. And again, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to do this. All you have to do is look up um, words in the, you know, in the concordance and then go to the de dictionary definitions in the back. Um, they give them to you by number, so you don't have to know Greek or Hebrew to find it. And, um, you know, I remember when I was in school, <clears throat> they always said, if you can't spell a word, look it up. And I said, well, if I can't spell it, how can I find it? And, and so they, they solve your problem in Strong's Concordance because they give you a number for the word. And then you look it up, and it, and it has the word in Greek or Hebrew, and then it gives the possible definitions. And so the main word part of Armageddon is Megiddo or Megiddo. And it's from the Hebrew root Gadad. Gadad, you can look up Gadad, and it really means to cut off, slaughter, or hew down. And the Hebrew prefix ar, or har, means mountain. Thus we have a symbol name that means mountain of slaughter, or mountain of destruction. So can Old Testament stories provide typology for the term Armageddon? The first significant Old Testament event connected with Megiddo is the story of Israel's victory under the leadership of Barak and Deborah over Sisera and his Canaanite army and Judges. So let's take a look at that. Judges 4 and 5 have all this. It says, Then fought the kings of Canaan by the waters of Megiddo. They, that is Israel, fought from heaven against Sisera, the river of Kishon swept them away. So what's another name for the waters of Megiddo? The river of Kishon. And we'll learn a little more about that in a minute. That's pretty important. Now in Judges 4, it describes more about the battle. It says, Sisera gathered together all his chariots of iron and all the people that were with him unto the river of Kishon. And the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. And all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Now, that's a, a different kind of battle. Because, you know, if you study wars in history, even the losing uh, army, most of the people survive. There's usually a big slaughter, and they lose and surrender. And it's very, very rare that a war ends and the losing side doesn't have a single person left. That just doesn't happen in history. But at this battle, it did. So the key thing here is that this battle, where not a man was left... By the way, if not a man is left, would you call that a slaughter? Yeah, a terrible slaughter. And was at the waters of Megiddo, which is the main part of the word Armageddon. And what, what are the waters of Megiddo also called? Kishon. All right. Now, the problem so far is we don't have a complete topology yet because what's missing? The word Armageddon is the mountain of Megiddo. There's no mountain named Armageddon or mountain of Megiddo. But there is a mountain that towers over the plain of Megiddo. And this mountain is well known because of an event that happened there. Does anyone know what mountain towers over the plain of Megiddo? Mount Carmel. Yeah. And so that means we're going to find more of our typology from the showdown on Mount Carmel. And it's not that complicated because, you know, you know the story, the showdown there. And um, Elijah... Elijah's showdown was with the prophets and priests of Baal, like 450 of each, 900 of them. 
And, but th we're going to see the meaning of Armageddon illustrated here in a way that's um, consistent or agrees with what was in Judges. So Elijah directed a decisive ending for those false prophets. In fact, we don't even have to go through much of the story. The key, the, the, key, the link is in just one verse, 1 Kings 8, 1840. So the fire comes down from heaven, consumes Elijah's altar, and then he gives the order regarding the priests and prophets of Baal. It says, let not one of them escape. And they took them to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So how many prophets and priests of Baal got away? None. Not one of them was left. So once again, the enemies of God's people were slaughtered without a survivor at the waters of Megiddo, also called Kishon, at Mount Carmel. By the way, it's the brook Kishon on Mount Carmel because the brook goes down the mountain. The waters of Kishon go down the mountain and down in the plain, it becomes a bigger river. And when it gets bigger, they call it Megiddo. But it's interesting that the brook Kishon are the waters of Megiddo. So John undoubtedly coined the term Armageddon to draw the mind to these two events. You know, think, keep in mind that while John was writing Revelation, he's writing in Greek, then all of a sudden he, sa he says, I'm going to coin a term here in Hebrew, Armageddon. And it's, it's obvious he's, he's given a hint that this is a code word. It's not a literal place, but it, 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 it connects the stories that he wants them to think about. So clearly Armageddon is a battle in which none of the wicked will survive but will be destroyed with the brightness of Jesus coming, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.8. So let's go to Revelation 19, because Revelation 19, um, verses 11 to 21, describes the two armies of the final battle. So let's look at Revelation 19. I'm going to be kind of quick with this. Uh, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. That fits the descriptions of Jesus and other places in the Bible. Then verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture, vesture dipped in blood. Obvious reference to his crucifixion. And his name is called the Word of God. And John's the writer here. And John's the one who wrote in 1 John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is obvious reference to Jesus. It says in the armies of and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's all the angels on horses. And if you jump down to 16, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I always thought that verse should end all the anti-Trinitarian talk. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. What else do you want? And then you go to verse 19. It says, And I saw the beast... And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. So now we see the opposing army. And it says, they're gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. These are all the kings of the earth and their armies. And then it says, the beast and the false prophet. And halfway down through verse 20, it says, And those who received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then it says, And then a the remnant, any left over, were slain with the sword of his, of his coming. So what we have in this passage is a complete destruction of the wicked by the armies of heaven. So this passage is a well-known description of the second coming and the destruction of the wicked. This final battle is a repeat and enlarged description of the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16 a war between heaven and earth. Let's go to Revelation 16 and look at it more. So in Revelation 16, verse 10, we have the fifth plague. And that's a plague of darkness. And then verse 12, we have the sixth plague. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And then verse 13, you have your three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. 
And verse 14 says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then verse 16 says, He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. This is the whole world in rebellion against God. The whole world, every nation. And then verse 17 says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial, and now we're at the seventh plague, into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done! So what's the first thing that happens with the seventh plague? An announcement, it is done. And then verse 18 says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And verse 19 talks about how Babylon gets destroyed, the, the city. And then verse 20 says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Verse 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So in Revelation 16, we see in the sixth plague, Euphrates dried up, preparing the way for Jesus to come. Verses 14 and 16 say the whole world is gathered to Armageddon. And then the seventh plague is poured out in verses 17 to 21. It's the destruct, destruction of the wicked that comes with the, that's connected to the return of Christ. You got your great earthquake, Babylon destroyed, every island and mountain swept away. Great hail, big enough to pulverize buildings, falls upon the wicked. It is clear that the battle of Armageddon is a battle between heaven and the united forces of all the nations of this rebellious planet. There is, a, there is a total victory for heaven's army, but for the wicked, not a man left. We looked at this verse when I did the sermon on the drying up of the Euphrates, because of the line that says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lift up a standard against him. But I wonder if you remember when the scripture reading was read, if you caught what the context of this verse is. This is actually a second coming verse. Because in Isaiah 59, 17, it says that God puts on the garments of vengeance. In verse 18, it says he comes with fury to repay the wicked for their wicked deeds. And then it says, so shall they feel the na fear of the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, the east. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Euphrates, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That standard against him is the drying up of the Euphrates and the return of Christ, the kings of the east. And then verse 20 says that he's coming for those who have not transgressed the law. In other words, it's a fantastic rescue mission. And so I would like to um, go to Great Controversy. Chapter 40, God's People Delivered. I'm on page 635. And this is where Ellen White describes the fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues. And she never says that's what they are. But at just the right time, she quotes the angel that announces that the seventh plague, it is done. And it's right in the right place. Listen to this. With shouts of triumph, jeering and imprecation, imprecation, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. That word rush is significant because what does Euphrates mean? Euphrates means to break forth rushing or flooding. And she's describing the wicked as rushing upon their prey when lo, a dense blackness, the fifth plague, deeper than the darkness of the night falls upon the earth. Then a rainbow shining with the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. The angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. Their mocking cries die away. The objects of their murderous rage are forgotten. With fear, fearful forebodings, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. That's the drying up of the Euphrates because they see the glory of God on the people they're about to kill and they realize those are the ones on God's side. And then they realize what they've done. Probation is closed. Their hearts aren't changed. 
but they see the truth all of a sudden. And in early writings, it describes them as looking for the people, the clergymen who deceived them and tearing them apart. That's the drying up of the Euphrates right there. It says, but the people of God, or by the people of God, a voice clear and melodious is heard saying, look up and lifting your eyes to the heavens, they behold the bow of promise. The black angry clouds that cover the firmament are parted. And like Stephen, they look up steadfastly into heaven and see the glory of God and the Son of Man seated upon his throne. And you know, it's interesting, Ellen White says, a little black cloud in the east. In his divine form, they discern the marks of his humiliation. And from his lips, they hear the request presented before his father and the holy angels. I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. John 17, 24. That'll be glorious to hear, won't it? Again, a voice musical and triumphant is heard saying, they come, they come, holy, harmless, and undefiled. They have kept the word of my patience. They shall walk among the angels. And the pale, quivering lips of those who have held fast their faith utter a shout of victory. Now listen carefully. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy, the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear, in one clear, space, of indescri is one clear space of indescribable glory. Whence comes the voice of God, like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. Amen. Revelation 16, 17. For now the seventh plague is coming. That voice shakes the heavens and the earth. That's what causes the earthquake. There is a mighty earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. She's quoting verses 17 and 18 there. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory from the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind and the ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. Fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon the mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Can you imagine that? Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. The sea seaports that have become like Sodom of her wickedness, are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's verse 19. Great hailstones, every one about the weight of a talent, are doing their work of destruction. The proudest cities of the earth are laid low. And then she goes to describe prisons breaking, breaking up and God's people coming out and... Graves being opened, she's just describing the resurrection at the end. It's obviously the resurrection and the second coming are kind of the same event. And so at that point, God's people, and this is another verse from Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 9, they will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Can you imagine seeing all that and realizing you're untouched and he's coming for me? Rescued from this sinful planet at last. Free at last. Free at last. Amen. Will you prepare to be on the Lord's side in the battle of Armageddon? The only right way to prepare is to make sure your heart is totally surrendered to him, that your heart is his. And that means everything in your life. You can't be partly God's and partly the world's. He doesn't share a divided throne. God wants all of our heart or he can't be our Lord and master. It's, in other words, when you're willing to be nothing, he can be everything. And that's what it's going to take to be on the right side in the battle of Armageddon, to be one who lives to see that glorious day and doesn't perish in it. That's my prayer for all of us and myself. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to Him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 
0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.